Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. Can you not do that? That's kind of loud. So today we have a super interesting unsolved mystery to look at. It was actually a missing persons case until this person was found, um, but now it's an unsolved murder case. It actually has been ruled an accidental freshwater drowning, but most people think that it was a murder case of some sort. And once I explain this story to you guys, you guys will understand why. The reason that this case is so interesting though, in particular, is because of a message that he left on his wife's voicemail right before he went missing or died. It's a voicemail unlike anything you've ever heard before. There are two minutes worth of noises, bizarre ones. Now that is pretty crazy and it's unlike anything I've personally ever heard. So before we get into that, let me break down this whole story for you guys. So today we are talking about a man named Henry McCabe. This is a picture of him. Henry McCabe was 32 years old, um, he was married and he had two children. He was a Minnesota State Revenue Department employee and so he was like an auditor. I am humble and proud of the Salvation Army, Liberian Command School System for giving him the opportunity to speak to you at your 2015 Most importantly, I am proud of you for taking on the paternal leadership. He was last seen on September 6th of 2015, and his disappearance and most likely his death happened on September 7th, Labor Day, 2015, in the early morning hours. Before we get started, I did want to say that this case was very, very hard um, for me to find information on. I feel like a lot of information is being withheld, probably because there's an active investigation going on. So it was Labor Day weekend of 2015. His wife was staying with friends in California, so he decided to go with his friends, and they decided to go clubbing. And he went with two of his friends, their names were Calvin Johnson and William Kennedy. The whole night is kind of confusing because there was alcohol involved, so I feel like there's a lot of like um, misremembering of things and especially when it comes down to timing of everything. So that night, Henry, Calvin, and William decided to go to this club. I'm pretty sure it's called Pavlitsky's or it's also referred to as C'est la Vie in some articles, but I believe it is closed now. This is footage from about a year ago, so I don't know what it stated in now, but this is from a YouTuber that I just found actually. His name is John Lorden and he makes a lot of videos on missing people and I think a lot of you guys would really like his content, so be sure to go check him out. I'll have a link to his channel the description box but he actually lives in the area and so he went out and did some video footage of a couple different areas um, that has been talked about throughout this case so this is video of the club that he went to anyway according to his friends he was drinking a lot one thing that you should know which I'm not sure how true this is because it's been somewhat reported by certain agencies, but not by others. Um, it's kind of complicated. I'll explain it a little bit later, but there are sources that say that Henry McCabe was dealing with a little bit of depression, that he was behind on his rent money. Apparently he had just had a bad review at work and his previous rent check had bounced. So it's possible he was kind of drinking to forget his problems and his friend said that he was drinking a lot. So they took his wallet and keys from him, which is a good move. It's a good thing as a friend to do that. At about 1.40 a.m., Calvin Johnson said that he he saw Henry leaving with her other friend William Kennedy in his car. Um, he was gonna, you know, take him home. What's very strange is that instead of just driving Henry home, William Kennedy claims that Henry wanted to be dropped off at a gas station. And at first, he told the police that this was the Super America. He later changed it and said that he actually dropped him off at a holiday gas station, I believe. Now that seems kind of weird to a lot of people because if your friend um, was, you know, drinking heavily enough where you had to take their wallet, why would you just drop them off at a gas station now? William says that Henry asked to be dropped off there. Sure, we're all going on. I wish, I wish I have never given a ride. Regret and more questions than answers surrounding the disappearance of Henry McCain. I got no motive. After a night out, William Kennedy says he dropped the state auditor off at this gas station in Fridley. It was the morning of Labor Day. When was the last time you saw Henry? The last time I saw Henry was the night that I dropped him off. And where did you drop Henry off? I dropped Henry off at the gas station, the as a gas station on Highway 65. Why? Because he asked to be dropped off, dropped off there. Why would you drop your friend off at some gas station at 2 in the morning? And also, they left him without keys or a wallet because they both still had those things. I think one of them had the keys and one of them had his wallet or something like that. And after this, there were a couple phone calls made and there is 
so many conflicting reports about who the phone calls were made to, what was said on the phone calls, how long they lasted, whether they picked up. It's like super confusing. I'm probably going to get this wrong. I believe the first phone call to his wife was at 2.28 a.m. So if he was dropped at the gas station around 2 or 2.15, that's not too long after it. However, there were these calls that were made. He placed a call to his brother and left a voicemail, and I never heard that voicemail, but there's also a voicemail that was left on his wife's phone. What's really strange about this is only part of the two minute voicemail has been released. It's very strange, it's extremely hard to find it on the internet. There's like only one or two news clips that I've found that have it, um, and it's just pieces of it. There's sometimes newscasters talking over it, so let me play for you the best version of it that I do have. <laughs> but one that's confusing, shocking, and scary. The message was left on his brother's voicemail on the early morning of September 7th, the last day he was seen. It's a voicemail unlike anything you've ever heard before. There are two minutes worth of noises, bizarre ones. with very little actual talking. Authorities confirmed the disturbing middle of the night call came from Henry McCabe's cell phone. McCabe's worried wife heard the message. His and my cell phone connected. Minnesota Community Policing Services is a nonprofit agency and acts as a go-between with police and the Liberian community. The leader is trying to help the family make some sense of this recording. The growls turned to high-pitched moans. So, like, like he's moaning in pain. Mo like moaning in pain. The tortured grunts suddenly stop. There is silence. Then someone, either Henry or another person, says, stop it. I try to picture where he was, um, what it might have been like, what circumstances would have made him sound like that. The voicemail is in stark contrast to other articulate recordings of McCabe speaking at an event. He's a state auditor. What is the justification? What is the right thing to do? I have searched high and low. Um, I was on Web Sleuths and Reddit, and I, I seriously cannot find it anywhere. Now, it's so weird as I was listening to this podcast, and the guy on the podcast was like, I totally have heard the whole thing before. It's like it was removed from the internet. But, and, and I can't find it anywhere. Um, have you looked for it yourself online, Steph? Yeah, it's not there now. It It's gone. It was gone ages ago. Yeah. It's really peculiar because it's something that I remember hearing the whole thing. Mm. I, I, mm. I absolutely remember hearing the whole thing back last year. And everywhere I look now, it's just not mm. available, which is very mm. peculiar indeed. But let's talk about that voicemail, okay? At the end of the voicemail, it's quiet, and then someone says, stop it. That is so creepy. Now, we can't actually hear that part of the voicemail because that hasn't been released. Um, just the information that someone else's voice was in it, and they said, stop it. It seemed like they've backtracked so much of this. Like, this is the sketchiest case. But that voicemail is pretty crazy. Um, you can hear him moaning, groaning. It sounds like gurgling, growling. I mean, could it be an animal? Could this be something supernatural like an alien? or a you know Sasquatch or something like that if you're if you believe in that kind of stuff I mean it's pretty crazy sounding it definitely doesn't sound human but there are many many theories of what it could have been so we'll get into that later in the first couple of days there was no activity in his bank account which is always something you look for with a missing person just in case someone robbed them he never contacted his employer or his family and friends after that call was made and his phone disconnected, it has never been since turned on. It literally seemed like he just disappeared without a trace, you know, there was no other cell phone activity. There is an organization there called the Minnesota Community Police Department and, and they help community members with things like this. They specifically work with the Liberian community in Minnesota, so, so they decided to help out with this case and they actually fundraised and raised $10,000 to be given as a reward. A month later, they pulled the $10,000 reward and said that his wife, I believe her name is Kareen, she was misleading and withholding information from the police, prohibiting them from doing an investigation. This is their exact quote. She is purposely withholding information and that we believe could lead to the location and recovery of Henry McCabe. We feel we have all been misled. We have an ethical and moral obligation to the community and this organization to do the right thing. And that was from David Singleton, who is the leader of the organization. Now I'll play a clip of him talking about this and the length of time that it's taking to bring the case to a conclusion is not because of the lack of effort by law enforcement but because the actors that are involved in this case 
are sophisticated and they've gone to great lengths to conceal their involvement. But because the actors that are involved in this case are sophisticated and they've gone to great lengths to conceal their involvement. And I just want to reassure everybody that uh, the Minnesota law enforcement agencies are doing everything that they possibly can. They also put out this statement on their website. In this case, there remains more questions than answers, inconsistent statements, bizarre audio tape, questionable friends, encrypted numbers, false information to police, obstruction of the active independent investigation. If Henry McCabe's death is an accident, like some may suggest, why are some of the people closest to him withholding and manipulating information? So that's super, super weird. Like what information is she not telling? We don't really know. Um, they didn't explain what they're talking about, but it sounds like something sketch was going on with the wife. And at first, when she first called the police and reported this whole thing, and I'm not sure how true this is because some sources report this and some don't, but apparently she said in the voicemail that she heard him say, I got shot, I've been shot. Part of the voicemail has never been heard. This is such a murky case that it's really hard to like find the truth about things. There was a, also a voicemail on his brother's phone, um, but apparently he was just crying and pretty much making the same sounds and noises. So about two months later in early November, his body was found. What's very strange about this is it was actually found six miles from where he was last dropped off at a gas station, which I also should mention is in the opposite direction of his house. He was found by a kayaker actually, um, face down in the water in a place called Rush Lake. Now I wanna look this up in maps and show you guys something. This is the lake that he was found in. One thing that's really strange about it is that you think maybe if it was found six miles from where he last was because he was dropped off at that gas station at about 2 a.m. and then the call uh, happened at 2.20. How could he have gotten to this lake and how was he found there? So it's, it's very, very strange. If you look, there's no streams or canals or anything that lead to Rush Lake, so it's not like his body just wound up there. Here's some footage of the actual lake area where he was found. Um, it looks pretty peaceful. It's not too close to forest or anything like that so anyone who's thinking like a sasquatch or anything like that uh even sasquatch believers <laughs> i've done some research on this i don't i'm not a huge like sasquatch believer but even they are like it couldn't have been that because it's not a like, very foresty area so it leaves us the question of what the fuck were those sounds on the voicemail we hear all kinds of noises we hear like gurgling and growling and gargling and just groaning moaning it's not very pleasant it sounds like he was being tortured to death now it's super weird is when they found his body first of all the coroner has decided that this was an accidental drowning a freshwater drowning which is very very strange because it doesn't explain the voicemail at all it's also really weird is his body had no um damage on it so there wasn't any scratches or injuries or anything like that so like no sign that he was even trying to fight someone off especially when they're making sounds like that you'd think there would be a struggle there would be scratches but there were no wounds or anything on his body which leaves us to think did he just accidentally drowned? What's very, very strange is that the FBI got involved in this case, which is kind of unheard of for just a random missing persons case, especially one that has been deemed a drowning, just a drunk night gone wrong that ended in a drowning. So why is the FBI involved in it? What really sticks out to me is the fact that, you know, he was supposedly having money issues, yet he was spending all this money at a club. Um, even someone who has money issues, like can't even pay rent, why would you go to the club and spend all this money? I mean, his friends were saying that he was spending so much money at the club that they had to forcefully remove his wallet from him. I mean, that doesn't sound like someone with a good government job that is also struggling with paying the rent. So it's very inconsistent and confusing. A lot of people think it's even kind of strange that they took his wallet because normally you would just take someone's keys. You know, it's their right, I guess, to continue buying alcohol, but I can see as a friend how you might make a decision like that. It's like, if you are a good enough friend to take someone's wallet and keys, why would you make such a shitty move to drop them off drunk with no wallet, no keys in the middle of nowhere at a gas station in the opposite direction of his house? I mean, it's just odd. Now, it is probably likely that the police um, and the FBI, if they're still involved, are withholding a lot of information from the public because this is an active investigation. It's possible there's more suspects than they've announced. The main thing that people struggle with here is the fact that this voicemail sounds like this man is literally being tortured. He's like screaming for his life. It's very scary. So why is it that they found absolutely no sign of trauma on his body? I mean, that's just so bizarre to me. One thing kind of makes sense for this, and that's the first theory that I'm gonna bring up, and that is the theory that he was waterboarded. 
now this sounds kind of crazy but I was looking into this and there's actually a group um, I'm gonna play a clip from CNN that explains this a little more but it's called the smiley face killers and these were some type of group of serial killers that were taking normally college-age boys who were drinking at parties and waterboarding them in the back of trucks and a lot of these people were just deemed drowning victims that were found in a body of water somewhere we find it on a tree at the port of Albany New York a smiley face painted in white, staring back at us. Retired detectives Kevin Gannon and Anthony Duarte came to find out. They believe a gang of killers may have murdered as many as 40 college-aged men in nearly a dozen states, leaving these six smiles as their trademark. Why would the killer or killers put the bodies in the water? Detective Duarte says water makes it the perfect crime. It makes it look like a drowning instead of a murder and it erases key evidence such as fingerprints or hair fibers so the killer can't be identified. I don't know much about these smiley face killers. I think I should probably do a whole nother video on it, but it makes sense because that would explain why there were no um, actual signs of injuries on the body if he was waterboarded. It seems to be some type of like sick fetish that these people have and um, normally the victims that they're looking for are people that are just wandering around late at night drunk that could have just possibly drowned it. So it's normally like, so Henry McCabe may have been like the perfect victim for this. There are quite a few theories about what could have possibly happened. Um, another one one is that maybe he had some type of enemy made in his job. Maybe someone in a position of power was audited or someone wanted to target him because of it. A lot of people actually connect it back to the Civil War in Liberia. A lot of people think that somehow it was connected to that and maybe that's why the FBI is involved. Another strange and interesting bit of this is that his mother in an interview said that she felt like her son had been sacrificed. Now that's pretty crazy, um, but if you don't know much about like sacrifices, a lot of times in other cultures Cultures. I'm not sure if this has anything to do with Liberia, but um, the idea of the sacrifice is that if you sacrifice someone, that when their soul is released when they die, you would get some of the power back. So that's an idea. There are theories that the friends murdered him and robbed him, but that doesn't totally make sense either. The phone call doesn't make sense. Either he butt dialed or he was in trouble and was trying to call someone and knew that he was leaving the voicemail from maybe inside of his pocket. Some people think maybe he was drowning. There's an idea that maybe he was given the date rape drug at the club and a lot of the times that will impair you completely um, to the point where you can't swim. But it's like, how did he get in there in the first place? I mean, his friends and family said he could swim. So it's just so fucking weird. Another idea I've seen a lot thrown around is that he was being tased and that's what the sounds were. And if you've never heard someone being tased, let me show you some clips of people being tased. Now these are all um, officers in training, um, but I want you guys to hear the noise because they do make a similar noise. There are so many theories to this. I mean, people even think that maybe he was abducted by aliens and that was the strange noises. I think the idea of being waterboarded makes a lot of sense. Um, I think it kind of sounds like the perfect murder to make someone look like they just naturally drowned when they were drunk. I truly have no idea. Um, I feel so badly for his family. Um, I know that some of them have been accused of not being forthright, but I like to, you know, have the benefit of doubt in people. Maybe it was his friends, but it's like, they possibly could have just lost their best friend just to a random killer. And, you know, I know they did make a really bad decision to leave him at that gas station, but it's like when you're drunk and you don't know what you're doing, like, anything can happen. It's all very sketchy though. It's all very strange. So I'd love to know your guys' theories. Let me know in the comments below what you think of this. Do you think he just was a guy who drank too much and wandered into a lake and drowned and like called his wife while he was drowning? Do you think that someone did this to him? Could it have been a Sasquatch or aliens or something supernatural or ghosts? Um, I was reading a lot about this online and there's a lot of people who do recordings of like supernatural stuff like ghosts and spirits 
spirits and they record the sounds like if you've ever seen any of those shows on TV where they're like recording ghosts and trying to communicate with them um, it's similar to that and a lot of the sounds that Henry was making were sort of similar to the sounds that they pick up so maybe it was something to do with ghosts but I don't know that's a stretch love to hear your thoughts please let me know in the comments below if you do know anything or want to correct me on anything definitely let me know if you can find the full voicemail on the internet hit me up because I'd love to add that to the description box because as of right now uh, I can't find it anyway definitely a very strange story um, leaves me completely mind boggled I wish I knew more I wish I had more solid explanation for any of this but it's very wishy-washy and there's not a lot out there it's just the craziest story I've heard in a long time I will leave sources in the description box if you do have any information that can help police in their investigation. If you are new to this channel, be sure to hit subscribe. I upload new videos on Tuesday and Thursday nights at 7 p.m. MST with a possible surprise video on Sunday at 7 p.m. MST. Be sure to hit the like button if you like this Unsolved Mystery series. And that's it for me today, guys. I hope you're having a great day, and I would like to end this video with a moment of silence for Henry McCabe.